I'm Dan Nichols, and I run the Early Career and STEM programmes at G Aviation Systems in Cheltenham. In this session, we're going to look at communication skills. You might never have spoken to an audience publicly and are terrified of doing this. Perhaps you've delivered a few talks and just want to improve. Or you might even speak to groups of people often. We can all improve, and wherever you are on your journey, Hopefully you will find something here to help you. Now this isn't just going to be telling you what to do or providing you with a formula. There will be some tips, techniques and best practice along the way. But mostly I just want to get you to think and reflect about what you can do next time you have the opportunity to communicate. What do we think of when we think about great communication? Perhaps Winston Churchill and one of his stirring wartime speeches. Maybe Dr Martin Luther King's inspirational I Have a Dream speech. Or maybe even Steve Jobs doing one of his amazing Apple product launches. Interviews, meetings, debates, formal presentations or giving a talk to a group of classroom students. It's all just communicating. Or just transmitting thoughts, ideas and information effectively inspiring others to think, change or take action. So how can we do this? How can we be better at it? And how can we do it in a way that works best for those listening? This is going to be what we think about during this session. There will be several points during this session where we stop to think and reflect. So you will need something to write with, and something to write on. We often assume that some people are just naturally great presenters, amazing communicators or inspirational speakers. But is that really the case? Get your pen and paper or whatever else you grab to write with and on and take a look at this video of Steve Jobs, former CEO of Apple and famed presenter in one of his first talks from the early 80s. Write down what you notice. Carrying cases are on allocation now. They should be off by summer. The security kit will be shipping in July and the keypad in September. The reason the keypad is in September is that it uses the same microprocessor as in the keyboard so that every keypad we ship, we uh, do not ship one Macintosh as these are on allocation right now. We hope to be off allocation by September. On the software side, Mac Paint and Mac Write have been recognized as great software products by the industry. Uh, both have won software packages of the month in various software magazines, and we're seeing pretty phenomenal acceptance uh, by the users of the Macintoshes out there now. So, in addition to the shocking 80s bow tie, braces and hairstyle, what else did you notice from this video? Well, Steve Jobs was standing in a podium and holding on to it really tightly. He was reading from a script and he was speaking very, very quickly. He was quite monotone and he was barely pausing for breath, even when someone in the audience started to clap. So this is nothing like the Steve Jobs you might recognise from some later presentations. But we'll come back and look at this again a little bit later. Why is a great question to ask before communicating with someone or a group of people? If we understand the purpose of the communication, it will be easier for us to prepare and easier for us to know if we achieved what we intended. But it's also worth considering why people spend so much time on presentation skills, why they spend so much time improving their speaking techniques and why we often admire those who can speak inspirationally. Almost everything we do involves being able to communicate with people effectively. But it's a learned skill. There's no such thing as a naturally good communicator. In the Steve Jobs clip, he was speaking really fast. There were no pauses, even for applause. He was reading from notes and barely even seemed to acknowledge or notice that there was an audience. So guess what? No one is naturally good, but it does take preparation practice and persistence.
I would like you to take just 30 seconds to think about a talk, presentation or a speech that you have given to a group. What did you think went well? What did you think didn't work? What did your audience think? Did you achieve what you set out to do or not? How do you know? Did you even think about the purpose of the talk? About why you were actually delivering it? So this is all great, but what if we're so terrified of speaking in front of others that none of the other stuff matters? Well, it starts with having a purpose and knowing what we want to communicate and then being present. If we're present in the moment, then we notice how those we're communicating with are receiving our message. But what about nerves or, or even terror? Well, there are surveys where public speaking comes higher than death on what people fear most. Fear of public speaking even as a name, glossophobia. So what actually happens when we're sat there waiting to give a talk or a presentation to a group and we're feeling the fear? Well first our fight flight freeze mechanism is activated which is great for escaping danger but not great for standing up and speaking to a group of people. The amygdala in our brain then kicks into action and our sympathetic nervous system releases adrenaline. Our adrenal cortex releases cortisol, which helps to keep us fully alert, but is also known as the stress chemical. This all results in a dry mouth, fast breathing, racing heart, tense muscles, sweating. Does any of this sound familiar? So what can we do about all this? Well, we'll take a look at this in a moment. So what is it that makes a truly great communicator? Is it what they say? Is it how they say it? Is it their body language? Is it the fact that they have really great slides? Is it their humour? Is it that they showed emotion? Or is it their presence? Well, fundamentally, it's about being authentic, about being yourself. People really do notice if what you do doesn't match what you say. We're going to look at some thoughts on being inspiring when speaking in a moment, but ultimately, if you delivered your message effectively and your audience understood it, then you communicated well. And this is your goal. So how do you even start? Well, have you ever sat down to prepare a talk or presentation and just stared blankly at the page? Have you thought about trying to reuse something that you've done before, even if it doesn't really fit? Well, in preparing, don't just start by opening PowerPoint or other software. Try pen and paper. If you're going to use slides, these are just going to be visuals or illustrations for your talk, and you'll add these later. Think about dividing your talk into three overall sections, three themes or points. And then take these themes and further divide them each into three further subpoints or topics. Think about your message and really know your topic. What is it that you want the audience to take away from what you said? What do you want them to do at the end? And then practice. Try videoing yourself and watching it back. Ask people that you know to listen to your talk and give you feedback. Let your passion for the topic really show through and think about using stories to really bring your talk to life. Stories can help us transform facts and information into things that really engage people and we learn most effectively from metaphors and stories. This can be great for translating really complex information 
into things that people still understand. All great stories have a setup or introduction. There's some kind of conflict or problem or journey. And then finally, a resolution or a happy ending. We're going to watch a video by someone called Drew Dudley. And he's talking about how we should thank people when they have an impact on our lives. Really look at how he uses a story to effectively communicate his message. And on my last day there, a girl came up to me and she said, I remember the first time that I met you. And then she told me a story that happened four years earlier. She said, on my day before I started university, I was in the hotel room with my mom and my dad. And I was so scared and so convinced that I couldn't do this, that I wasn't ready for university, that I just burst into tears. And my mom and my dad were amazing. They were like, look, we know you're scared, but let's just go tomorrow. Let's go to the first day. And if at any point you feel as if you can't do this, that's fine. Just tell us, we will take you home. We love you no matter what. And she said, so I went the next day and I was standing in line getting ready for registration and I looked around and I just knew I couldn't do it. I knew I wasn't ready, I knew I had to quit. And she says, I made that decision and as soon as I made it, there was this incredible feeling of peace that came over me. And I turned to my mom and my dad to tell them that we needed to go home. And just at that moment, you came out of the student union building wearing the stupidest hat I have ever seen in my life. <laughs> it was awesome. And you had a big sign uh, promoting Shiner M, which is Students Fighting Cystic Fibrosis, a charity I've worked with for years. And you had a bucket full of lollipops. And you were walking along and you were handing the lollipops out to people in line and talking about Shiner M. And all of a sudden, you got to me and you just stopped and you stared. It was creepy. <laughs> this girl right here knows exactly what I'm talking about. And then you looked at the guy next to me and you smiled and you reached in your bucket, you pulled out a lollipop and you held it out to him. And you said, you need to give a lollipop to the beautiful woman standing next to you. And she said, I have never seen anyone get more embarrassed faster in my life. He turned beet red and he wouldn't even look at me. He just kind of held the lollipop out like this. <laughs> and I felt so bad for this dude that I took the lollipop. And as soon as I did, you got this incredibly severe look on your face and you looked at my mom and my dad and you said, look at that, look at that. First day away from home, and already she's taking candy from a stranger. <laughs> and she said, everybody lost it. 20 feet in every direction, everyone started to howl. And I know this is cheesy, and I don't know why I'm telling you this. But in that moment when everyone was laughing, I knew that I shouldn't quit. I knew that I was where I was supposed to be, and I knew that I was home. And I haven't spoken to you once in the four years since that day, but I heard that you were leaving. And I had to come up and tell you that you've been an incredibly important person in my life, and I'm going to miss you. Good luck. And she walks away and I'm flattened. And she gets about six feet away, she turns around and smiles and goes, you should probably know this too. I'm still dating that guy four years later. <laughs> a year and a half after I moved to Toronto, I got an invitation to their wedding. Here's the kicker, I don't remember that. I have no recollection of that moment and I've searched my memory banks because that is funny and I should remember doing it and I don't remember it. And that was such an eye-opening, transformative moment for me to think that the, maybe the biggest impact I'd ever had on anyone's life, a moment that had a, a woman walk up to a stranger four years later and say, you've been an incredibly important person in my life, was a moment that I didn't even remember. How many of you guys have a lollipop moment, a moment where someone said something or did something that you feel fundamentally made your life better? All right. How many of you have told that person they did it? So whether we're giving an interview a talk, a presentation, or we're just involved in an important conversation, it's vital to make a connection with the people who are listening. We can use emotion through humour and vulnerability and personal stories. This will help us transform data and information into something that's real, something that's relevant, and something that people will remember. Making emotional connections with people who are listening is the key. They'll remember you, they'll remember what you said, and they'll trust you. We're going to watch a video of President Barack Obama's acceptance speech in Chicago in 2008. He had just become President of the United States, and notice how he uses a story of Anne Nixon Cooper to talk about America's journey over the 20th century. He uses metaphor to talk about how people made a difference because they decided to do something and took action. There are many stories that will be told for generations, but one that's on my mind tonight is about a woman who cast her ballot in Atlanta. She is a lot like the millions of others who stood in line to make their voice heard in this election. 
except for one thing. Ann Nixon Cooper is 106 years old. She was born just a generation past slavery, a time when there were no cars on the road or planes in the sky, when someone like her couldn't vote for two reasons, because she was a woman and because of the color of her skin. And tonight, I think about all that she's seen throughout her century in America, the heartache and the hope, the struggle and the progress, the times we were told that we can't, and the people who pressed on with that American creed, yes, we can. At a time when women's voices were silenced and their hopes dismissed, she lived to see them stand up and speak out and reach for the ballot. Yes, we can. When there was despair in the Dust Bowl and depression across the land, she saw a nation conquer fear itself with a new deal, new jobs, a new sense of common purpose. Yes, we can. When the bombs fell on our harbor and tyranny threatened the world, she was there to witness a generation rise to greatness and a democracy was saved. Yes, we can. She was there for the buses in Montgomery, the hoses in Birmingham, a bridge in Selma, and a preacher from Atlanta who told the people that we shall overcome. Yes, we can. A man touched down on the moon. A wall came down in Berlin. A world was connected by our own science and imagination. And this year, in this election, she touched her finger to a screen and cast her vote. Because after 106 years in America, through the best of times and the darkest of hours, she knows how America can change. Yes, we can. America, we have come so far we have seen so much, but there's so much more to do. So tonight, let us ask ourselves, if our children should live to see the next century, if my daughters should be so lucky to live as long as Ann Nixon Cooper, what change will they see? What progress will we have made? This is our chance to answer that call. This is our moment. This is our time to put our people back to work and open doors of opportunity for our kids, to restore prosperity and promote the cause of peace, to reclaim the American dream and reaffirm that fundamental truth that out of many we are one, that while we breathe we hope, and where we are met with cynicism and doubt and those who tell us that we can't, we will respond with that timeless creed that sums up the spirit of a people. Yes, we can. Thank you. God bless you. And may God bless the United States of America. One effective technique that is often used in communication is called the format system. This is often used in training, in classrooms and in talks. And it covers the various learning preferences that people in your audience would have and covers four fundamental questions that people will be asking themselves when they listen to you. The first question to answer is why? Why should the audience be interested? Why are you talking about this particular topic? And this caters for the type one learners who are searching for meaning. The second question to answer is what? What do you want to tell me? What are you actually going to be speaking about? And this answers the question that type two learners will be asking when they're looking for concepts. The third question is how? How would you do this? How does this actually work? In a training, this is the part where you would actually give a demonstration or get people to try things out. And this covers the type three learners who are looking for skills. And the final question to answer is what now? What should people actually do after listening to you speak? How should they take action? And this covers the type four learners who are actually looking to do something or try something out. So why, what, how and what now are four questions you should always seek to answer to effectively communicate with people.
So you're going to need your pen and paper again. And I'd like you to take just 30 seconds to think about how you felt before giving an important talk or presentation. What was going through your mind? What did you feel like? And how was your breathing? Also, think about how you felt during the talk. Where was your focus? How did the way you felt impact what you were thinking and saying? Did you even notice any of this at the time? We talked a few moments ago about the fear of public speaking, but how can we actually improve this? We restore balance in our bodies through the parasympathetic nervous system. Try breathing from the diaphragm, in through the nose for five seconds, and then out through the mouth for a further five seconds. Repeat this for about a minute and notice how different you feel. Be present and focus your attention in the moment. Try visualising a calm place, perhaps the beach or the sky. Our lips are full of parasympathetic fibres. Try running a finger over your lips to stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system this can be a really quick fix to bring some calm. I know it sounds weird, but try it. It really works. You could try some power poses. Research by Amy Cuddy at Harvard University shows that you can reverse engineer confidence. Stand up straight with your legs apart, hands on hips, or your arms in a V-shape above your head. Stand this way for two minutes before giving a talk, perhaps somewhere private. Amy Cuddy's research has showed a marked decrease in stress of people who adopted these poses. And blind tests on the audiences between people who had and people who had not performed these poses before speaking reported that the people who had performed the poses appeared much more confident. What about displaying confidence when actually giving a talk? Have you ever watched someone giving a talk who was nervous and demonstrated this through their body language? Perhaps moving from foot to foot, pacing aimlessly, putting their hands in and out of their pockets. So think about a home position that you'll return to again and again when you're giving a talk. It's okay to move away from it, but always come back to this square home position. Stand up straight, square onto the audience. Put your feet slightly apart, parallel to each other, with one foot in line with your shoulders, and put your hands down by your sides. This can be a very relaxing pose that can also be calming for your audience as well, and will not detract attention from the things you are trying to communicate. When giving a more formal talk, Try to stand in the middle of the stage, platform or speaking area. If possible, have your slides displayed on the audience's left and your right. If you're using a flip chart, place this on the audience's right and your left. Try to put yourself in the centre as your home position. The focus should be on you as the speaker. The slides and the flip chart are just to provide visual and illustrations for your talk. If you move around, do this with purpose. Try to move and then stop and then talk, but always return to your home position in the centre of the speaking area. If you use hand gestures, these should be with purpose to emphasise what you're saying 
but then always return them to the sides of your body. Sometimes this might not be possible because you have no control over the stage or platform area setup, but whenever possible, think about using these techniques. Previously, we looked at a very early Steve Jobs presentation. Look back at the notes you made and what you observed. Now we'll move forward 25 years to 2007. During these 25 years, Steve Jobs gave many presentations and talks, but he also owned Pixar, the animation studio, and worked with storytelling experts. In 2007, Steve Jobs spoke to 3,000 people at the launch of the original iPhone. What do you notice about his communication this time? Well, today we're introducing three revolutionary products of this class. The first one is a widescreen iPod with touch controls. The second is a revolutionary mobile phone. And the third is a breakthrough internet communications device. So, three things. A widescreen iPod with touch controls, a revolutionary mobile phone, and a breakthrough internet communications device. An iPod, a phone, and an internet communicator. An iPod, a phone. Are you getting it? These are not three separate devices. This is one device. And we are calling it iPhone. Today, today Apple is going to reinvent the phone. So, some final thoughts before we wrap things up. As we saw with Steve Jobs, presenting is a journey. We all have to start somewhere, but you'll always be able to improve. Each time you present, you'll do some things well, but you'll also do some things that you can improve next time. So here are a few fine resources to help you on your journey. For inspiration, have a look at ted.com. This is an amazing collection of inspirational talks on technology, education, and design from some of the world's best communicators. Here are three to start you off. Amy Cuddy, who I mentioned already, did research into how to reverse engineer confidence with body positions. But watch this talk to see how dry research data can be brought to life and how to use emotion, vulnerability, and a personal story to be truly memorable. Brené Brown speaks about how authenticity and showing vulnerability inspires confidence and trust. And Brené Brown has made a career out of this research. And Monica Lewinsky became one of the most famous people in the world, but not for a good reason. And she is one of the few people to read her TED talk, but notice how powerful it still is. Here are three great books to improve your communication. Talk Like Ted by Carmine Gallo analyzes the best TED Talks and highlights what makes them great. TED Talks by Chris Anderson, who is the curator of TED, shows how the best presenters prepare and deliver their presentations. And Steal the Show by Michael Port has a Hollywood actor talking about the performance of presenting and communicating. And if all else fails, there's always plan B. 
So here are six B's to remember the next time you have to effectively communicate. Be active. Take every opportunity to present. Presenting is a learned skill and takes practice. Be reflective. Ask for feedback to learn and to improve. Be calm. Take a moment. Find which techniques work for you. Be present. Practice focusing on the moment and notice how the audience or person is responding. Be authentic. Be the best version of yourself. Look to others for inspiration, but don't try to copy other people. Know your topic and let your passion show. And be kind to yourself. Being kind to yourself means looking to improve each time. Everything that's worth doing takes time to become skilled. But you'll always forget something and you'll always know you could have done better. But this is just good reflection for next time. If you communicated what you wanted to, to your audience, you did what you set out to do. So take a bow and know that you just moved a bit further along your journey. Take a final 30 seconds and think about the next time that you're going to communicate with someone. How will you prepare? What will you start doing? What will you stop doing? And how will you be different? So thank you for taking the time to watch and good luck 